What is happening guys? My name is Chris. And I be Pirate Paul. Arr. Arr. And welcome to part two of our conspiracy special. You've heard my side of the story. Paul is going to be telling us all about what he has found. It's going to be interesting. All that and more after the intro. Yes. What's this stuff you got then? Seeing as Dan thinks I'm the, the older guy, thanks Dan, I think maybe I should do the historical stuff. I'm going to have to read some of this off the screen because I can't remember it all and it's got really big words as ever and I haven't got an auto cue. I've got an auto cue. I've got an iPad. Uh, and bad eyesight. So just to reiterate, we are debunking the myth of the Magna Carta and whether you can use it as a defense in 2021. We're not looking at other conspiracies like 5G and the New World Order or anything like that. We're just looking at whether the Magna Carta arguments can stand in 2021 as a legal defense for leaving your tattoo shop or your barber shop or any other shop open. For anybody who hasn't watched any of our episodes about Magna Carta, what is the Magna Carta? The Magna Carta was an agreement that a group of barons forced King John of England to sign in 1215. It famously stands for the principles that the king is not above the law and his subjects have certain guaranteed rights. Although, for the most part, the relevant subjects turned out to be barons and not the people. The provision, referred to as Article 61, was an attempt to provide a little insurance in case the king tried to weasel out of the deal. Let me read to you Article 61 as it was written. The barons shall elect 25 of their number to keep and cause to be observed with all their might the peace and liberties granted and confirmed to them by this charter. If we, our Chief Justice, our officials or any of our servants offend in any respect against any man or transgress any of the articles of the peace or of this security and the offences made known to four of the said 25 barons, they shall declare it and claim immediate redress. Make no redress within 40 days, the four barons shall refer the matter to the rest of the 25 barons who may disdain upon and assail us in every way possible with the support of the whole community of the land by seizing our castles, lands, possessions or anything else saving only our own person and those of the Queen and our children. Having, <laughs> having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal obedience to us. In order for the people to work with the barons, do they have to do anything? Any man who so desires may take an oath to obey the commands of the 25 barons for the achievement of these ends and to join with them in assailing us to the utmost of his power. We give public and free permission to take this oath to any man who so desires and at no time prohibit any man from taking it. Indeed, we will compel any of our subjects who are unwilling to take it to swear it at our command. That sounds like you're going to be fucking forced at gunpoint to do it. Although it wouldn't have been gunpoint, would it? It would have been knife point. So if they say, I do not consent, does that work? Or? No, I don't think you could not consent to the Magna Carta. Right? <laughs> Basically, the barons got to file the grievance and if the king didn't redress it within 40 days, they could start a war. And anybody who uh, could join in if they wanted by swearing an oath to obey the barons when they told him to assail something. Well, basically fight or smash something up, I guess. This apparently explains the oath of allegiance to Lord Craigmile of Inverness Shire. These people claim to be joining up with a, a baron, a right, they say, is guaranteed by Article 61. I'm probably not the person to give advice on the Magna Carta, on Article 61. I only knew about Article 61 when it was flagged to me in the House of Lords. Are you still with me, kids? Good. Magna Carta, or Grand Charter, which is what it means, is considered to be a landmark document in Western civilization as it represents a monarchy giving power over to other people. It's formed the basis of English law and the rights of the English people. It's also a very old document. It's about 800 
years old now and it's been replaced over the years by many, many other legal documents that now form the basis of our law. You may have seen online that people are committing their oath and signing up to something called the Lawful Rebellion. And there is a Lawful Rebellion website in Canada that you can go to and you can read and you can find the places to sign your oath and all that sort of stuff. So you might be thinking, what is Magna Carta Lawful Rebellion? Yes, what is Magna Carta Lawful Rebellion, Paul? Oh, let me tell you, Chris. People who are a part of it believe they can simply refuse to accept the current laws in their country. On not consenting, they can return to the laws of the Magna Carta as the basis of law and start all over again. I do not consent. Although they may have consented for the past, say, however long they've lived. They use pseudo-law arguments to support their various theories and claims. It is, in fact, the third wave of pseudo-law. The first wave were the detaxers, and the second wave of pseudo-law were the free men of the land. These documents that you see are emblazoned with a strange crest that says, practice lawful dissent. The authors of these items declare that they have sworn an oath of allegiance to Lord Craig Mile of Inverness Shire. I wasn't sure what I was doing in the, uh, when that oath was presented. It was presented to me as something which might add a little bit of pressure, um, possibly within the media. It's an extraordinary claim uh, and the result of Article 61 of the 1215 Magna Carta and the actions of a group of rebel barons whose resistance to crown treason began in 2001. That's still almost eight centuries after the death of King John in 1216. So your next question might be, Paul, what is pseudo-law? Yes, what is pseudo-law, Paul? <laughs> Let me tell you, Chris. Pseudo-law is a collection of spurious, legally incorrect ideas that superficially sound like law. Oh, is that, is, is that very similar to, like, that fucking, you know, like, ah, oh, what's it called now? This is people using jargon that sounds like it might be the law to convince you that it is actually a real thing that you can do. Basically, it purports to be real, but in layman's terms, and we are laymen because neither of us are, are solicitors, pseudo-law is pure nonsense. Now, now remember that, it's pure nonsense. I'm reading from Wiki, and I, so I'm going to get this guy's name wrong, Donald Netolitsky defined it as a collection of legal sounding but false rules that purport to be law. It is sometimes referred to as legal gibberish. The more extreme examples of pseudo-law have been classified as paper terrorism. Really? Yes, from Wiki. Followers of such ideologies can cause problems for courts and government administrators by filing unusual applications that are difficult to process. Courts in Canada, for instance, refer to such arguments as organised pseudo-legal commercial arguments, or OPCA, and have called them frivolous and vexatious. Now you know why I'm fucking reading this off the screen. Yeah. <laughs> there is no recorded instance of such tactics ever being held up in a court of law. Common law pseudo-legal belief is a belief that one is partially or fully sovereign from the country, and a belief that no law, or only certain laws, apply to the believer. Pseudo-law belief can also mimic mental illness. So would you say that people who are people who are feeling kind of, you know, depressed with the situation that they're in would then be more inclined to believe this kind of stuff and fall into the trap of the lies? Absolutely. It offers you a false hope, doesn't it? It offers you an out. If you're, like I have been all this week, sitting there with the fucking dark spectre of doom sitting over me, you know, and, and panicking. If all of that is getting to you, I think that's why this has come up so strong recently. A bit like the QAnon thing that I was talking about, it gives people a false hope yeah. that they can take control over a situation that they feel helpless in and that they feel they have no control over. And that's why a lot of people are, are finding it something that they can, that they can believe in. But it's fucking nonsense, kids, I'm, af I'm afraid. It just doesn't work. No. Groups espousing such pseudo-legal beliefs include Freeman of the Land and the Sovereign Citizen Movement. Some believe that their state itself is illegitimate. Also under the umbrella of pseudo-legal arguments are conspiracy theorists who believe that there is a secret parallel legal system 
that one can access through certain means, like using a secret phrase or by placing stamps on the right documents. For example, the Redemption Movement believes that a secret fund is created for everyone at birth by the government and that a procedure exists to redeem or reclaim the money from this fund. I've seen people say that about like um, they take out an illegal contract in your name. Yeah, yeah, I've seen some like people talk about that. Like, okay, so that revolves around the, the idea of legal name fraud. Uh, it's the legal name fraud movement. That's interesting. Like, you know, it's it's an interesting theory, and it makes an interesting plot for a movie. Do you know what I mean? Well, they, they believe that the the birth certificate gives the state legal ownership of a personal name, and refusing to use that name, therefore removes oneself from the court's jurisdiction. Uh, various groups advocate uh, that one can avoid the state ownership by distinguishing between capitalised and non-capitalised versions of one's name or by adding punctuation to your name, also known as straw man theory. That's quantum, uh, quantum freezing that, isn't it? By the time I got to this part, I was so far down this fucking rabbit hole, I'd, I'd lost the will to live. <laughs> That's why I haven't texted you all week, because every time you text me, I was like, fuck him, he's making me do all this fucking bullshit research. I know, I, I can see that now. <laughs> so to give Paul a tiny bit of a break, right, the whole part of using punctuations within within names and, and, and writing, that is, I seen it on a video, somebody posted up the other day, and I, I, I thought it was really interesting. Quantum freezing, and when you look into quantum freezing, I believe it was like an engineer or something from uh, somewhere in America decided that similar vibe, he didn't want to do stuff that he, he didn't believe in and you know he was a free man and everything and he came up with this whole quantum kind of freezing system like we might have to do a video on it because it is interesting like how a mechanic just decided that he wanted to do this because he didn't want to you know he was a free man and uh, he created um, this whole new way of writing which is complete nonsense like. Do you know what comes to mind when you're talking about this? You know the phrase, you should get out more? Yeah. Well, because none of us can get out more, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's why, why all this shit is happening, because people are just sitting in their fucking houses trying to complete YouTube. Yeah. Can I carry on, Chris? I've only got one last bit to do. Yeah, I just wanted to give you a little bit of relief. I've had to do this in chunks this week. It's, it's, it's fucking done my head in this, house, to be honest with you. I hope you appreciate this, folks, because I, I really do think me and Chris have took one for the team this oh, yeah. week, you know, <laughs> for this research. In all seriousness, I do hope this is useful. Based on the few things I've already said, a name has come up a couple of times, a guy called Lord Craig Mile. So you might be thinking at this point, who's Lord Craig Mile? Who is Lord Craig Mile, Paul? Well, let me tell you, Chris. <laughs> like all good conspiracy theories, there's always, and, and we've done a lot of research into these for the show over the last sort of six months, there's always a grain of truth. That generally is what makes them like a compelling argument because it's something that you can look up and go, that actually happened. So this, all the rest of this pseudo law must be real, right? So in 2001, Lord Craigmile of Invernessia or Invernessshire for our American friends or even Canadian friends was one of a group of peers in the House of Lords, so that's in England, who signed a letter asking the Queen not to agree to a treaty. Now the treaty was called the Treaty of Nice and it increased the power of the EU's Parliament. They mentioned the provision of the Magna Carta in doing so. This supposedly was the declaration of war that I mentioned earlier on. Somehow, Craig Moyle became seen as the representative of this group, which all of the pseudo law and conspiracy theories called the new rebel barons. And people are now swearing oaths to him personally. So I'm gonna put in a YouTube clip where he says he's received hundreds, if not thousands of letters from people over the years in which they swear allegiance to him. And he seems nothing but a bit sort of confused by the whole thing, to be honest with you. But you're receiving lots of Article 61 oaths, aren't you? At the Maybe moment? as a result of giving my support at that time, um, I'm receiving lots of uh, oaths from people. I haven't kept count it's over several years probably tens of thousands by now. Wow. What upsets me slightly is a lot of these letters have personal testimonies within them and I can't possibly open them all. I okay. sometimes open them, I've, I've answered one or two at random, but uh, I can't open them all. And these are, these are good stories of people who uh, feel that they're not being heard and they want to be heard. And 
I'm not the person to hear them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what are all these letters I'm getting? The home that you have to send it to is in the Outer Hebrides, which is you go right to the top of England and then have to go across a little bit of sea to get there. So it's a really... He basically, he doesn't want to receive mail. He's moved that far away. Basically, a bunch of barons stood up in the House of Lords and when the Queen signs this treaty, she's basically giving up her sovereignty of England. She's committing treason. With, and so people went, oh, they're the new rebel barons and invoked the Magna Carta. You might be watching this in the UK and thinking that this is only affecting England. But the, the whole free man of the land and this Magna Carta 2020 movement and everything, this is going on all over the world. People are citing this in Canadian court. Yeah, yeah, and they're failing as well. Well, they're going to court in Canada and going, Your Honour, can I refer you to Article 61 of the Magna Carta? And quite rightly, they're saying, well, all right, look, here's the thing. First of all, the Magna Carta uh, was changed in 1216. Uh, and Article 61 was immediately taken out. So from 1216 onwards, so for about 800 years, it, it hasn't been valid in the UK. But in 1215, we didn't know where North America was, let alone Canada. And, <laughs> and English law didn't apply in Canada until 1763, by which times there'd been a few changes that were already in effect half a millennium earlier. Yeah. Uh, in including Canada now being independent of the UK. Uh, so even if the Article 61 theory were, was correct, it, it still wouldn't apply in Canada. <laughs> Absolutely not. It doesn't apply in England, so there's no way it applies in Canada and or North America. Um, another related flaw is that there were later versions of the Magna Carta, including the one the following year, and none of them, none of the later versions after the first initial draft included Article 61, because everybody probably realised it was a stupid idea. In other words, as a legal argument based on an 805-year-old document has been wrong for 804 years. And that, kids, is me resting my case for why the fucking Magna Carta will not save you in 2020. Take your tin foil hat off and uh, go and have a cup of tea. And just enjoy some time with your family, like. Oh, Chris, mate, fucking hell. This is my thing, see? I, what I don't understand, right, it's like, you know, certain people aren't, you know, haven't met the criteria because maybe they, they've opened up their business in the past 12 months, but I'm sure there they is other help there for them. But generally, right, if you are a business owner, right, and you have a legitimate business and you've done everything above board, right, you have financial help. We had a grant for the business in our first lockdown, and we had self-employed grants. Yes, there was not as much as, you know, what we normally would have be in a self-employed person, but it was money and it, it did help. This time round now, you know, people are furloughed. The furlough has been extended. They are giving more grants. We had, you know, I think for our business, we had 3,000 pounds for the business for having a 17 day lockdown. Um, and then we've also get to apply for another grant on the 30th of November. So there is financial help. This is not a tyrannical government that is trying to mess us all up and destroy businesses. It is a government that is trying to, if you believe in it or not, it is a government that is attempting to sort some situation out. Like there are people within the government, which I'm not saying like, and, I'm, and these aren't the, the, the people running the show, there, but there are people within the government that, that, it, that are attempting to resolve everything for its all, but there are other people in the government that possibly are trying to do things. Can I just add something to this, you know, to all these, uh, to all these kind of people that stand there as proud Englishmen that are free men of the land. Well, I've been watching a TV show recently called The Crown, which is the history of the British monarchy and a big chunk of it takes place in World War II. And I was reminded of the sacrifices that our grandparents made in World War II, where there was austerity in this country for like nearly 10 years, you know, and they had to mend and make do, and they had to keep calm and carry on. And there wasn't one of them when they were told that they had to walk a particular way around the supermarket, felt that it was okay to fucking smash the place up. That's, yeah, that's like, do you do, do oh. All you gotta do is put a fucking mask on and just get on with it. Like, and, and if you really are one of them people that are proud of your country, think about the sacrifices of our grandparents and what they had to go through 
Um, th this is nothing by comparison. You've got to walk one way around a supermarket, so when you're told to, you've you pull all the fucking wine off and you won't have it. And there's a, uh, you've seen the footage of the bloke smacking, trying to smack the woman's what? face. What? No, now. You fucking bunch of spoiled, entitled fucking snowflakes. Yeah. Get back in your house and shut the fuck up. Sit down for four weeks and do fuck all. Stay in your house. I mean, cut, please, you know. Put a mask on, stay in your house, watch Netflix. PlayStation 5 is out now and the new Xbox is out. Like, you, you, come on. Like, you are literally getting paid to stay at home in your pants and play on a PS5. I've been feeling absolutely dreadful for the last couple of weeks. I'm not enjoying this lockdown at all. I get that there's an anxiety and a stress, but your anxiety and stress does not give you the right to go and abuse people in shops and taxi drivers and all that sort of stuff. I mean, come on. Have a, have a bit of fucking class and just, you know, but Paul said something earlier on, right? And he made and it was quite interesting actually. The first lockdown, we were all we were feeling the same. We were feeling shit. We were getting depressed. I think it's a creative thing where you feel down, you get depressed. And um from that we took what we think something a bad situation and we feel like we've created something out of that and turned it into a positive, which has helped us mentally and, and we believe it's helped other people as well who watch the show. And It is literally why we started the podcast, wasn't it? Because we were just sitting, talking on FaceTime, getting fucking drunk together and making each other feel better and when well, we should start recording them. Bingo, six months later, we got the fastest growing tattoo show on the internet. Yeah, 530 subscribers. Yay! Yeah, it's getting 530. Oh, I'm happy with that. Like, I'm amazed by that. I'm amazed it's 530. If I could and I can't in this, you know, I, I would give you all a hug. But instead, I'll, I'll give you all, five a, you all one of them elbow bumps. Thank you, everybody. I question the elbow bump. I know, I know, because you cough into your elbow. <coughs> what you got to do, you got to have one elbow for coughing, one elbow for bumping. It's like, you know, chicken wings, isn't it? Ah. <laughs> you got to do fucking Usain Bolt. Right. <laughs> <coughs> oh, and so that's it for a, another episode this week. I hope it's been informative to you, and I hope you, um, you, you'll be well through that packet of biscuits by now. Uh, if you did enjoy it, Please hit like, hit subscribe, and tell all your mates. We'll be out here every week with news, views, tips, conspiracy theories, and a bunch of other nonsense. I've been Paul. And I've been Chris. And before we go, I've got something else to tell you. You could be in with a chance of getting your hands on a free Solnova Unlimited with two extra batteries. All you've got to do is subscribe to our channel, hit the notification buttons, and follow us on our Instagram, which is at that tattoo show. And uh, we will be hoping to get a thousand subscribers. And if we get them on the 31st of January, we will be announcing a winner. And with that, I guess that's been that tattoo show for this week. We'll see you next time. Take care.